Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to English's celebration of ASU's homecoming and to the 2018 Homecoming Writing Awards and Talk. So thank you all for being here. I'm Kevin Sandler. I'm the chair of the Homecoming Committee and associate professor in the Film and Media Studies uh, program in the Department of English. Uh, please feel free to grab you know, something to drink if you're able to, food during, uh, during any of the presentations. Uh, but they'll be certainly uh, out there afterwards for you to, uh, for you to enjoy. A little bit about the ASU uh, Homecoming Writing Awards. It was established 11 years ago in 2007 at the request of Randall McCraw Helms, who is an emeritus professor here in the Department of English. And the awards are funded by donors to the department's scholarship account. And so we thank all the donors who have made this possible in terms of contributing uh, to the awards. This year, the awards are given in four categories, poetry, fiction, creative nonfiction, and scholarly essay. And we'll hear from all the winners uh, today. I also want to thank this year's judges for all their hard work in reading all the submissions and choosing the winners. And I particularly want to thank George Justice and Bradley Reiner for organizing the submission process. Uh, this contest always garners the most submissions of any of our awards and scholarships, and it was very difficult to choose the winners. And so now, let us hear them read from their work. So first up, uh, we will have Damaris Castillo, who's going to read Maya Descent, uh, who is the winner in poetry. Please. Okay, I'm a little nervous, so please be patient with me. And, okay, well, here I go. <laughs> okay. Mayan Descent, Part 1. When the sun and the moon came to the sky. A mix of cacao and spice with a dash of celestial stars to complete the evergreen earth. Weathercolor birds and critters to make the ground vibrate. Mother jaguar coming to the river of life. One drink becomes not one, but two. Wild forest untamable, strong with force and knowledge, the gods pleased with their make of clay and air. Part two, that is not my name. When the bell rings, everyone starts to run to their spot. One by one, the little sprouts gets called. Adam, Juan, Leslie, Max, Miguel, Andy, Maria, Rosa, Becca, Lola, James, Rebecca, and Tamales? All eyes and fingers laugh, popping out of their frame with glee. Are you filled with chili or beef? The hyenas grew and grew, ready to take another bite of the masa. Chitipin, seed of sun, burns their carnivorous bellies to ash. Little ocelot wonders, will it ever end or will it start again? Part three, little bean. The cacao taste is sweet yet bitter. Some like them for the rainbow expressions, others just for their spicy curves. Tequila goes down smooth, yet burns when it reaches the heart. It aches, but wants more to drown its sorrows. Marachi, proud of its green, white, and red blood, as it oozes with its grito de independencia. Aren't you an anchor, baby? Corazón, will I find my peace or no? Part four, the conquistadors. Macau squawking the morning call. Huracan brushing his flowers with a kiss. Ginchin Aja hugs them with warmth. Jaguars playing hide and seek with white tailed deer. Squid ink oozing the sapphire de la vida. A foe, unknown, stepped afoot. Jaguar growls with force. Slash of the knife to hold the native's tongue. You will learn English. A fling of the claw, the feline prounces. Done with enslavement, done with following, done with hiding devouring its loss, insults, and threats. The taste of Jamaica, bitter yet sweet. The puzzle is complete. You will never destroy my roots. That's my in the sin. Thank you. Next up, the winner of the Scholarly Essay Award is Emily Gadbury. And she will read, from as long as the love remained, land as catalyst for healing and transformation in ceremony.
Thank you. So my essay is really long. I'm probably only going to read the introductory paragraph and a little bit of the first paragraph. I hope that's okay. All right. <clears throat> as long as the love remained, land as catalyst for healing and transformation in ceremony. This is where we come from, see? The sand, the stone, these trees, the vines, all the wildflowers. This earth keeps us going. So remarks one character to the novel's protagonist in Leslie Marmon Silko's Ceremony, a classic tale of self-redemption set against the backdrop of the Laguna Pueblo Native American tribe. It is said that, quote, stories in Laguna culture bind people and the world together as a means of preserving life, close quote. And as one reads the novel Ceremony, it becomes clear that this is one of the piece's main goals. To accomplish this goal, Silco frames both the development of the overall plot and the development of each individual character as a transformative experience and a process with the world around them. The plot of Ceremony follows Tayo, a young mixed blood of white and Native American ethnicity as he strives to recuperate from the horrors witnessed in the Pacific theater of World War II. To overcome the effects of trauma, as well as the alienation he feels as a living biracial embodiment of the intersection and contradictions of Native American and white culture, Tayo must rediscover both his own identity and the identity of the Native American community as a whole. Through an in-depth exploration of both his physical and metaphysical surroundings. By engaging in this process, Tayo transforms from a broken individual in all possible ways at the novel's beginning to an individual who can approach life with a sense of coherence and wholeness by the story's end. Overwhelmingly, this wholeness stems from the development of Tayo's relationship to the landscapes in which he finds himself. Native American spirituality is integrally tied to the landscape. As Paula Gunn Allen states, quote, the fundamental idea embedded in Native American life and culture in the Southwest is, the earth is the mind of the people, as we are the mind of the earth. It is a give and take relationship between individuals and landscapes, and one that has significant power to bless both sides. Throughout the novel, one perceives the benefits of Tayo's transformative relationship with land in three forms. The first benefit is self-healing through the realization of new paradigms of life, which Tayo comes to understand through his relationship with land under more experienced guidance. The second benefit is the ability that Tayo gains to a certain extent to heal the land based on his forays to restore balance in a variety of ways. Finally, the third benefit that Tayo gains through his positive interactions with landscape extends to those around him as he is able to use his own healing to become a positive tradition bearer and influence on members of the overall community. Before Tayo enlists in the war, he has lived a life that, overall, has been guided by respect and appreciation for the traditions of his forefathers. When he and his brother Rocky hunt deer together, it is Tayo who believes that, quote, the deer gave itself to them because it loved them, and he could feel the love as the fading heat of the deer's body warmed his hands, close quote. However, after he returns home from the horrendously traumatic war, he begins to interact with landscapes on a more perfunctory level. From caring for the ranch to traversing its roads with war comrades in search of temporary pleasures, he utilizes his surroundings to accomplish his own personal ends. It is only when he seeks out those who possess a different form of knowledge as a way to cure his sickness that he begins to perceive his most instinctual need. This need is to reevaluate his as well as everyone else's relationship with land. Thank you. Uh, next up, the winner for creative nonfiction. Myra Vasquez Chavez for Por Mi Madre. A 
so I wrote my essay about my mom being a Mexican immigrant and being a first generation Mexican, Amer Mexican American. <laughs> Being a first-generation Mexican-American is a constant balancing act of trying to fit in and proving yourself. My interests, hobbies, and desires are predetermined by my cultures. My family tells me I'm supposed to be Mexican first, but I pledge allegiance to the American flag in my classroom every day at school. I'm a traitor to my Mexican culture when I begin to stray away from the cultural expectations. I represent something too American to my Mexican family when I want to be an individual, but I'll never be able to navigate through America if I stay stuck in my Mexican collectivist culture. I was too Mexican for Americans and too American for Mexicans. My identity became a jigsaw puzzle that was formed based on expectations rather than inspirations. The pressures and expectations of being a first generation Mexican American contradict themselves. No one is rooting for you to succeed, but there's also no room for failure. It feels like the world is on my shoulders to make the people around me proud, especially when I've been granted this opportunity by my mother to live out the dreams that she couldn't. But there wasn't a guide or tutorial in dealing with conflicting cultures and practices. I couldn't say I was literate in being Mexican or American when I wasn't sure what being Mexican or American meant. I know my family is from Mexico and I was born in America, but did these titles grant me anything more than expectations or stereotypes to fit into? I feel like I performed the cultures as a cover up instead of living it. I am one of the first in my family to experience American culture while simultaneously being surrounded by a vastly different Mexican culture. I've had to create my own path with the burdens of creating an identity that I wasn't sure was truly my own. Not fulfilling the practices and beliefs of Mexican or American culture outcasted me within the communities I was part of. But as I've grown and experienced moments in my life, I have learned that I'm not restricted to anyone's expectations. These identities are titles and are a part of me, but they're not my only identity trait. Next up, the winner for fiction, Miranda Williams. The Gardener's Son. Hi everyone, thank you all for coming. I'm only gonna read the first three pages because it is quite long, um, and so I'll just start. It was two days after his father got arrested when Elijah's mother finally lost it. He had awoken to her screaming, but it was not directed at him as one would expect at nine on a Sunday morning when he had yet to get dressed for church. Now he stood behind the sliding glass door, staring at its smudged pane as he watched his mother strip the cherry trees of their branches, ripping them limb by limb until they were nothing but leaves scattered on the ground and pillars of empty wood. Cherries fell onto the pathway that trailed through the backyard and his mother trampled them. Their flesh burst on the cement, staining it a dark crimson. Elijah's little sister, Esther, looked next, lurked next to him, with eyes widened to the size of 50 cent pieces, and under them, tired gray circles bloomed on her pale skin. Their mother's hair flailed around in the windless summer air, and she continued mutilating the tree, and the small muscles in her thin arms bulged. She was mesmerizing and horrific, like an angry goddess. An uncomfortable feeling, one that made vomit brew in Elijah's stomach and his, hand turned his hands turned cold, settled into his skin. There was a massacre unfolding in front of him. Elijah looked at Esther to see a few tears roll down her cheek. An ache emerged in his throat and he brought his right hand to cover her eyes. And she should have pushed him away like younger siblings do. But Esther only turned to rest her head on Elijah's shoulder. She sobbed just identical by the slightest of hiccups and the droplets that birthed scattered spots of wetness on Elijah's shirt. At 13, his sister was only two years younger than him. Their father had assaulted a girl Esther's age, Julie Byers. They didn't know if it had happened more than once or exactly how much damage was inflicted. Elijah could only imagine him lifting up her light pink training bra and pulling down flower printed panties. She had probably left with violent, with violet bruises on her hips and an ache between her legs, and he, crescent moon cuts along his wrists and red, swollen lips. I was supposed to go to her birthday party next week, Esther said, burying her head deeper into his skin. He was glad that Esther didn't say Julie's name, and a shaky, anxiety-ridden breath escaped his lungs. He could feel Esther's tears mixing with the sweat on his neck. Esther turned her head to look out the glass door once again. I wish you would just stop it, she continued, in a, in a voice muffled by cloth and crying. I know, Elijah replied. Mom's just angry. He wanted to mention that he was too, but it didn't feel like the right time, nor did it feel truthful. Elijah really only felt sort of sad and sort of nothing. 
He placed his hands on Esther's back as he embraced her, glancing up to see that his mother had ended her rampage and was now staring at them. She was a wild animal who had just been caught ransacking the garden. Wide eyes, bloodshot and glossy, her hair t a tangled whirlwind, and bare feet now coated in a layer of red juice and dead grass. Esther stepped back and Elijah met her eyes. She had all their mother's features, earth-colored hair that fell in waves, thin nose, honey eyes, milky skin, and mirrored her even more so with the tears still dripping like a leaky faucet. Elijah resembled their dad. He hadn't been able to look at his own autumnal hair in the mirror for the past two days. Their mother was walking towards them with her head jerking from the direction of the sidewalk to either fences on the left and right side of the yard. Esther's hand crossed over her thin waist to hold her left arm. Dad's going to hell, she said. Elijah stiffened. The comment pierced him in a way that was sharp and distinct. It was what they had all been thinking, but he hadn't expected to be confronted with the thought so soon, and especially not by Esther. He rolled his shoulders back and took a breath that felt unstable in a way, like he was putting more supports on a house that would surely fall. Okay, he said just as their mother made it to them. His mother opened the sliding glass door and both Elijah and Esther stumbled backwards so that she could step into the house. They were all silent for a moment and Elijah inspected the muted yellow curtains, noting every stray thread. The room was bloated, stuffed with warm, sticky air and a buzzing fly made circles around the kitchen table. The, the stare of their mother wore Elijah down like prison shackles. With reluctance, he met her gaze. What on earth are you two doing? Go get ready for Sunday school, she said, ignoring their raised eyebrows and parted lips. She hurried past them and started towards her bedroom. The old lino linoleum floors groaned under her feet, and Elijah started to speak. But, and y'all stop looking at me that way. You didn't care nothing of your father's garden no time before. Go get ready.